From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. Today, we're here with Susanna Pollock, the president and director at Games for Change, a nonprofit that empowers game creators to create social impact through games and immersive media. Susanna, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we're here with Kate Littman, who's a founding teacher and curriculum specialist at Quest to Learn, a New York City public school designed around the principles of games and game-like learning and a mentor for the STEM Your Game Challenge. Kate, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Kate, yesterday the city of New York announced that all schools would be closing effectively immediately. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Quest to Learn and about how you all are adapting your model to these current challenges? Well, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely in a strange universe right now. I'm sitting in my neighbor's kitchen because she's at work and I have no private space to do my teaching remotely from home. Um, but I think, you know, Quest to Learn is a really special school where we use all of these game design principles in how we plan our curriculum and then how we plan professional development and things of that nature. So I am literally every day trying to figure out what games have I played in previous years that I can get the kids to play this year that will work on an iPad or an iPhone or maybe a Chromebook. And, and how do I teach the kids how to unblock flash player if that's a game that's still, <laughs> that we're still using. And so there is definitely a lot of workarounds to getting these games that we've built and that we've used for many years and are successful implementing and sort of translating them to a remote setting. So that is every day like a problem solving protocol that we have to figure out. So it's a challenge. Um, we just did a PD on Monday where the teachers learned some Google Chrome extensions through a goose chase um, scavenger hunt game. So we're, we're still trying to live up to our principles even in these challenging times. You know, what you say resonates so much with what we've heard from so many teachers. I mean, especially really veteran master teachers like yourself, where you put all this time and effort into building something that works in one context. And then it's almost like becoming a first year teacher again um, of trying to have to, I mean, maybe it feels a little bit like the, like the founding year of Quest to Learn um, of saying, you know, we know we have these principles um, and we have to now sort of rapidly figure out how we're gonna make them work uh, in this current context. Um, are, there, are there any sort of adaptations, things that you or your colleagues have done over the past few weeks or months where you go, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been really hard, but wow, that one landed really well. Um, that's exciting to, to see an example of how we can make our models still work at a distance. Well, this is sort of a silly example, but some of the games that I've been able to play historically, like Ratio Rumble that used to be hosted through Math Snacks and Brain Pop used to host the game as well. Like if I can't get a kid to play at home, like I can give them my remote control through Zoom and they can play through my computer. So that's kind of like a workaround. Um, and I think Jamboard is definitely like the next place I'm gonna be looking to build some of my card games in a sort of digital space where the kids can manipulate them at the same time. I haven't haven't done that yet, but that's my next plan of attack. And then honestly, you know, I'm a math teacher and Desmos is my bread and butter and I love them so much. And there are so many games, sorry, activities on Desmos that are game-like and are really living up to some of those principles, even though they're technically just math activities, there's so much quality out there that's worth exploring for all subject areas. Because in the Desmos platform, you know, I mean, I think that notion of play, the idea that you're not just um, trying to get students to, you know, operate certain functions, but to get them to, um, to do what gamers do, to explore, to test, to iterate, to have a trial and to have there be um, some kind of playful context around it. You know, we've, we've had uh, um, Dan Meyer uh, come on uh, recently and, and talked with Mike, Michael Prashan, who's also used it quite a bit. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Um, Susanna, how has COVID and the shift to remote learning influenced your thinking about the possibility for educational games? Um, when we're thinking about creating engaging remote learning experiences, what can we learn from Games for Change? Well, we um, have been working in the education space for quite a few years in running a game design program uh, with for middle and high school students um, where we 
typically would train educators in person at PD sessions to, to bring this program into the classroom. Now, of course, with COVID, we don't have that opportunity not only to, to meet with the educators firsthand, but then the educators themselves aren't working with, this, with the students firsthand. Um, but what we found through uh, this past year is that most of the, the work that we do is transferable to a virtual setting. Um, educators are looking, like Kate, looking for new and innovative ways to connect with their, with their kids kids in a, in a virtual context and that game design and game like learning there's more of a demand for it now there's more of a there's a recognition that this is actually a really useful and effective tool and medium in which to engage their kids whether it's in a design context like what we what we have been doing with our with with, with the schools that we've been working with the past five years or as as a medium in which to teach curriculum through. So you know, it, it's an odd silver lining. You know, we um, uh, this very terrible situation that we find ourselves in uh, around the world. Um, but for the for the for the advocacy that we've been doing about the positive nature and the use that games can have in the classroom, it's becoming more immediate now, and people are responsive. Susanna, Games for Change has a STEM Your Game Challenge where game developers have until December 1st to submit their game either in a final a released version or a kind of beta. Um, Susanna, can you tell us about the challenge and what inspired it? Sure. So this particular program that we're running is actually focused on the professional game developer community, um, as opposed to uh, educating younger people on how to make games. Although the output, the games that we're looking for the developer community to uh, submit are to serve that audience. They're to serve middle school students, particularly um, focus on STEM education. But the community that we want to tap through this challenge is the uh, commercial entertainment game developer. The game developer who might not have thought about the use of their games in educational context, but think that there might be something unique about their game that if paired with a, a curriculum developer, a curriculum advisor, or an educator like Kate, could actually find those threads, those connections to align with STEM education um, and find their way into the classroom as a um, having like a an added bonus of somebody who's working strictly in the commercial and the entertainment space, but with an education focus. And Kate, you're a mentor for the STEM Your Game Challenge, um, you know, trying to build these bridges between the education community and the game development community. How do you guide developers when they're trying to adapt games into learning experiences? Well, I'm new at this work, but normally what we look for is some sort of learning objective that's going to line up with the curriculum that we're teaching. Um, and so I think sometimes an educator, when looking at an entertainment only game, can sort of see like some of the mathematical representations, some of the like close reading you have to do when you get backgrounds of different characters in different games. And so I think that added level of the educator lens and to, to sort of pick out the different learning goals that could potentially be embedded into the game or sort of added in as a layer is something that a mentor can offer to the game designers that are purely focused on entertainment. So I think like Among Us is a really good example where... So Among Us is this game which is just blown up uh, across the United States and it, people might be familiar if you went to summer camp um, with games like Mafia or Werewolf um, but in this version of the online game, there are 10 uh, little astronauts who are trying to operate a spaceship. And it turns out that one of them is an uh, imposter trying to um, uh, blow up the spaceship and the other nine people have to figure out uh, who the imposter is. Um, so it's kind of uh, um, a deductive reasoning kind of group dynamics game. So, how, so what kinds of connections do you see with that and school-based learning? So, you know, it could be anything... Uh like something as simple as like behavioral analysis where you're looking for the ac actions that seem normal versus the actions that seem suspect and like is there some sort of ratio that's going to sort of tip you off and you can think about that proportional reasoning um, logic you can also think about the movement on the screen and if their character is moving in a, a way that's um, abnormal so i think there's there's ways for you to tweak some of these games and add in that learning component um, with just like a little bit of teacher expertise. And Susanna, is the hope that the games themselves will change, that like the producers of Among Us would submit 
a kind of like Among Us EDU version with different features and functionality that highlighted these things or that there would be curriculum that was built around these um, game learning experiences? Like what's the, um, what, what do you think is the most promising way for this kind of integration to happen? Well, we're not expecting the commercial game developers to, um, to have the expertise uh, off the bat, right? To say how they would adapt the game for educational context. What we do want them to do is to tease out where they think there might be a direction to go and a willingness to partner with the educators and the curriculum advisors that we, that we bring into the project. Um, we very much see this as a collaborative effort and are very excited about bringing these two disciplines together. That's very much what Games for Change is all about. And at the end of the day, um, we really hope that we are going to inspire, you know, a whole sector to think about ed tech as a viable um, outlet for, for their games. What, what are some of the characteristics that a winning submission will have? Well, I think what um, uh, what Kate was referencing, I think, is is relevant. So we were, we were looking for a game that, uh, well, first of all, the game has to be at least a beta level or or released, right? We're not looking at uh, game concepts. So the game developers um, have to show proficiency in the ability to adapt and, and to create a fun and entertaining game. Um, it has to be... Uh, uh, built in such a way that we can unpack it and uh, add uh, threads to it that have, would have a curriculum and a learning goal um, uh, engineered back into the game. Uh, but we're keeping our minds really open as to what, what the look of the game would be like, um, what the original uh, concepts or the type of game, whether it's a uh, uh, endless runners game, or it's a first person shooter game. I mean, there, there are a, a number of different, uh, types of games that would, would qualify. So looking back over the last, um, 20 or 30 years of efforts to integrate commercial games into, um, schooling and teaching and learning are, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I was a history teacher for a number of years. Pe a number of folks were very interested in how um, the civilization series of games could be used in teaching and learning. Um, as you're, as you're thinking about what these things might be able to look like, um, are there examples from the past that you could point to where we say, you know, this was kind of a high point for the integration between, um, between games and schooling? Well, I particularly like um, uh, Civilization is a great is a is a uh, great example. Um, that game, um, although there hasn't been formal curriculum designed for it, you know, clearly had um, aspects of it in terms of the world building and having to develop um, financial systems, uh, security systems, economic um, and sustainability sy uh, systems. Uh, really lends itself really well. But then there are other games, like I love talking about Assassin's Creed because there's a commercial game that um, certainly did not have an interest to be educational from its early design, but it was it was developed alongside a franch franchise historian who put you know terrific effort into making sure that there were historical you know references. And Ubisoft saw this opportunity as they saw educators who were modding the game for years trying to figure out how to bring it into the classroom because you had generation of, of kids falling in love with world history. And then they went ahead and developed Assassin's Creed Discovery Tour, which took which stripped out some of the aspects of the game, like the first person shooter aspect that couldn't be experienced in the classroom, but created more of an open-ended kind of museum-like experience, which used the assets um, and the visual design and the historical context that kids love. Um, um, and that to me is more probably one of the more recent examples um, that I'd like to see more of. That's great. Um well, Susanna Pollock from Games for Change and Kate Littman from the Quest to Learn School, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. That was Susanna Pollock and Kate Littman. Thanks to them both for joining us. Be sure to check out the STEM Year Game Challenge. And for game developers, submissions are open until December 1st. I think for teachers and educators, uh, it'll be fun some months hence to find out who won and learn more about them. You can find a link to the contest in our show notes. 
I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Be sure to subscribe to Teach Lab to get future episodes and check out the new book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, available from booksellers everywhere. You can read reviews, related media, and sign up for online events at failuretodisrupt.com. That's failuretodisrupt.com. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe. Until next time.